everybody. This is Steve coming to you with Writing Musings 11. Um, okay, this one I've got four basic topics with, and I figured to cover these fairly quickly. Hopefully, that's the theory. Uh, <laughs> but these are things you want to consider when you're writing. This, this is going to cover mostly sci-fi, uh, so I just wanted to throw these out here since they're all they're all related. Uh, but anyways, starting with the first part here. Uh, the realities of space combat and travel. <clears throat> One thing you have to realize when it comes, especially with sp uh, space travel, distances between objects are huge. I mean, straight up huge. Uh, you know, not trying to get into a lot of math here, but you got to consider that uh, light speed, or not light speed, uh, yeah, light speed is about 180,000 uh, miles per second. Yeah, I think that's correct. About 180,000 miles per second. And if you figure about that, you're talking... Uh, ignore that. Let's see if I can clear that. There we go. Get something nice and clean. Anyways, if you consider you got 180,000 miles per second. So about that much. Uh, if you take time, you look at you have 60 seconds in a minute times 60 minutes in an hour times 24 hours in a day. That's 86,400 seconds. Times 365 days in a year as we count it. And you have 3 million, or no, excuse me, 31 million, 536, yeah, 536,000 uh, seconds. And then if you figure you go 180, whoops, 180, thousand miles per second times that that's the number of miles you're going to be traveling in a single year at light speed and so <laughs> yeah T it, distances in space are huge uh, and I point this out just from the idea that you know a lot of people when they think in sci-fi of distances and traveling and oh yeah this is this is only six days at warp six or eight days at warp nine and or you know or whatever FTL technology you end up using they're like oh yeah it's not that far well you got to consider that one AU the distance between the Sun and the Earth uh, I'm temporarily blanking on it but I think it's like either nine or, or eight minutes or something like that. I think it's like eight and a half minutes, if I remember correctly. Uh, I'd have to look it up to get the exact number, but it's like eight minutes just over that short distance from the sun to the earth, and that's short in galactic standards. Uh, it takes eight minutes for light to travel that distance. The, uh, the closest, I think, actual star to earth is five light years away. So basically, you take that number I just showed you times five, and that's how many miles. And if you think an Earth scale, how far a mile is, and then you got something that's like, you know, 12 or 15 decimal points for one light year, all of a sudden it's like, wow. <laughs> so that that's a big difference or big distance. Now, um, another idea for distances here, uh, th and this applies to space combat too. Uh, like, let, let's just use Star Trek. A lot of people know Star Trek. Um, and they say, okay, we have, a, we have an object at 50,000 kilometers ahead of us. Okay. You know, in Star Trek terms, that's not that far. That's short, short distance off the bow. The Earth, just to give you an example of distances, distance, is 25,000 miles around, roughly. It's, that's a rounded number. It's not an exact number. But at the equator, Earth is roughly about 25,000 miles around. So 50,000 miles is going to be twice around the equator. The moon, if I remember correctly, and again, I'm going off numbers in my head. I didn't think to, to grab this because a lot of these I just do off the cuff. So you'll have to apologize. And a lot of these you can look up if you need to. But if I remember correctly, the moon to Earth is like 250,000 miles. So that, you know, that right there, and you consider how close the moon is, all of a sudden, 250,000 miles ain't that far in space terms. Uh, 
So you have large distances. Uh, speeds. Speeds are not going to be like, you know, you're doing 70 mile an hour down the road. You're doing like, uh, well, one of the things I did in my Earthfleet series is I, instead of doing miles per hour, I made it more relatable by doing uh, astronomical units. Because since you're talking on the larger scale, it's easier uh, to estimate, es <coughs> excuse me, estimate astronomical units than it is miles. Which I think one astronomical unit is 91 million miles, roughly. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but or you can look it up yourself. But I think it's like 91 million miles. So, you know, all, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, those distances aren't that far, especially when you're traveling at like, you know, 600 AUM or astronomical units per minute. You know, that, that that right there is flat out hauling, but like the Sergenius, if I'm remembering my information correctly, uh, I think her top speed in the Gen 2 version, not the Gen 1. Gen 1 is slower. Uh, the Gen 2, I think, though, uh, which is the one you see in the series, it top ends 100,000 AUM. And, you know, that's literally just balls to the wall for the FTL drive. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those... Be careful not to fly her apart, Scotty. Things, <laughs> you know, she can she can hit a hundred thousand AUM, but your balls to the wall, and that ship is just totally not liking you for that. You can do it, and you can do it for a limited amount of time, but your engines will overheat, and you'll have to you'll have to bring it back to about you know half that to to cool them off and let them let them regenerate and catch up and everything like that. But anyways, that that all aside, you know when you you know I say all of that just to point out a fact that. You know, in space, you've got huge distances and you've got huge speed. So if something is 50,000, you know, 50,000 miles away or 50,000 kilometers, whatever, me you know, whatever measurement system you use. Uh, I'm not going to say who's better. It's, it's just what your, you know, what your country and your culture's preference is. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're talking, you know, at 50,000 miles, kilometers, whatever, you can close that distance in space real freaking fast especially if you're like at ftl speeds uh and this is one of my big gripes you see like in star wars star trek stuff like this because like uh, give you some examples uh picard season one last episode you see starfleet jump in with oh probably close to 100 ships i guess i'm not sure what the exact head count was but it's probably close to 100 ships and these guys are armpit to armpit it's deep space speaking because i mean these guys if they would have maneuvered a little bit left or a little bit right they would have been ba they would have been banging fenders that's how close they were in real space combat that's not going to be how you're going to do it because you're not going to jump out of sp out of ftl right on top of each other like they do in star wars and star trek because you got to remember you're coming f you know yeah okay you're coming out of subspace but you're still traveling at a ridiculously high rate of speed and suddenly coming into close quarters? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's not real. That's not reality. Uh, I even, even I mention, you know, even I try to avoid that when I'm working on my books. Now, not perfectly, because you, you have to have some degree of believability. And most people, when they see space combat, they think about it in fight, you know, like fighter planes or, or ships on the ocean going at each other, which, you know, even, even ships on the ocean, you know, they're anywhere from 10, 20, 30 miles apart in older battles uh more modern battles i think they have missiles that'll reach out about 120 miles so even then they're not that close a uh, carrier group will run i think the tightest a carrier group will run is about a mile between ships and, you know and even then they're kind of considering that one step short of banging fenders so you know if you scale it up to galactic scale you could be out 150,000 kilometers and somebody punches it to 50 percent light speed uh you're going to be sitting in the dude's back seat in a couple of seconds. <laughs> you know, cuz you figure you go with, go up to say uh ha half of light speed would be uh 90,000 kilometers per second and they're sitting out off at 150,000 kilometers. Yeah, you punch it to 50% FT or 50% light speed and you're sitting in the dude's back seat within a couple of seconds. But you're thinking that's impossible. That that's 150,000 kilometers. Yes, but light speed is 90,000 kilometers or 9,000 miles per second, per second. So if you're up half light speed, you're traveling 90,000 miles per second. Like I say, two, within about less than two seconds, you're going to be in that guy's back seat. So, 
that's something you've got to consider, which then comes down to the idea of weapons. Uh, the only way weapons are going to be close in, short range, is if you have something like uh, Wing Commander, where these guys, they'll jump into an area, but they're using like wormholes and, and singularities and stuff to jump from point to point, which means they're not coming out at FTL speeds. They're coming out at sublight speeds, and I would say they're probably... <sighs> Their cruise speed, based on what I saw in the series, would be somewhere around 50,000 miles an hour. You know, but still, 50,000 miles an hour, and these guys firing torp their guys are firing torpedoes that are going 150, 200,000 miles per hour, assuming the ships are cruising at 50,000, which I would which I would assume they were, given the distances that they they cross and the time it takes to get them for them to cross those distances. I'm guessing their standard cruise speed is going to be around 50,000 kilometers or miles per second. Uh, I'm going back and forth. I know the two of them aren't equal, but I'm just kind of throwing that out there for you guys to chew on. Because, you know, some of you don't know what miles per hour is, and some of you don't know what kilometers per hour is for distances. Since they're close enough, I just kind of trade them back and forth. Because, and, you know, when you're talking about space distances, 50,000 miles and 50,000 kilometers is not that different. They're, they're pretty darn close when you're talking in space scales. Uh, but, yeah, those weapons are going to be reaching out 200,000, 300,000 miles. Not 120, not 75, 100 to 300 to 500,000 miles. And they're crossing that distance in... Uh, I'm trying to remember what the, dis what, the, what the hang time was for the missiles in uh, Wing Commander, just using that as an example. Uh, I think hang time was probably about 10, 15, 20 seconds. I'm guessing, because it might 10's the low end of what it could have been. 20 seconds is probably more realistic. Uh... So if you figure, let's just say the distance is 200,000 to the other ship and it had a 20 second hang time. That's still, what, 10,000 miles an hour that that thing's traveling, I think, if, if my math is right. Uh, and again, I suck at math. 200,000, 20 seconds, yeah, about 10,000 miles an hour. Just to give you an idea, uh, a normal missile on Earth only travels at about, about more Mach 4, Mach 5, and Mach 1 is the speed of sound, or about 760 miles an hour. So Mach 4 is four times that. So now you see what the scale differences are. But then again, they're not fighting an atmosphere, so they can, you know, they can definitely travel a lot faster. Because you look at the Apollo mission, it took them three days. I think it was two days, three days to get out to the moon. I think when they hit orbit, they're hitting about 50,000 miles an hour. So, you know, that, <laughs> you know, once you get out in space, 50,000 miles an hour is not a problem because you don't have the resistance of the atmosphere you have to fight through. That's why missiles in atmosphere are so much slower than missiles outside the atmosphere. Because if I was up, say, on the IIS and I fire a missile, that sucker ain't going to top out at four to f or Mach 4 or Mach 5. That sucker's going to go something like, you know, 20, 30,000 miles an hour by the time it tops out or runs out of fuel. So that, that's minimum. It could go, you know, it could go 50, 50 70, 100,000 uh, miles an hour. Because like I said, there's no resistance and it's just raw thrust. So that also comes down to space in between ships. Uh, you know, when you're talking about things like, you know, Picard Season 1, Episode 10, I think it was, the la whatever the last one was. You know, those guys all jumped in, be and I, I kind of already touched on this, but yeah, they'd all jump in on top of each other. Uh, Star Wars, Battle of Endor, they all jump right in on top of each other. In actual space combat, the distances between ships is going to be so big that that Star Destroyer that in Star Wars, Battle of Endor, you know, in the movie, you're up there, you know, you're up there nicking the hull plating. In actual reality, that, that, uh, Star Destroyer is going to be a little dot on the horizon. You hammer the throttle and suddenly that dot, that dot grows real big and, and, and starts going small again real fast because you just pass by it burning 100, 150,000 miles an hour or minute depending on what your FTL or what your sublight system is. And you're just, you know, you're just like, you know, these guys out there like the X-Wings, they're not going to be flying around like you see in the movie and it, it cuz that's more like jet combat. You know, where you're doing Mach 1, Mach 2, and, you know, even the specs on the X-Wing is kind of like, oh, yeah, they mock, they max out at, like, about Mach 1.5, I think it is, or 1.25, something like that. Uh, 
I think somebody said they max out at like a thousand miles an hour. Uh uh. Atmospheric a thousand, sure. Deep space, now that sucker should be hauling at least about fifteen to twenty thousand minimum. Uh, I'd probably uh, gauge it around fifty thousand. Now, when you think about that, and this guy's got to do a hard right turn, fifty thousand miles an hour to make that turn to go ninety degrees and not kill the pilot with all the G's. The turning arc on that thing is going to be huge. It's going to be, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of miles just to cur just to hang on, you know, a 90 degree right turn or left turn. That's why, you know, when you look at it in Star Wars, you know, you look at it in the movies, it's not physically and uh you know, it's not physically accurate. Uh, okay, it's a movie. It's entertainment, yes. But one of the things I like to drive home, and that's why I'm bringing this up, is you need to keep in mind reality. What is it actually going to be like? That's why I mentioned like The Expanse. The Expanse is a great example of you know G-forces, acceleration, turn velocities, uh, inertia, all that stuff. Uh, it's, it's hard sci-fi, but it also is a good one for you to consider when... Uh, when dealing with uh, stuff like that. Because Star Trek came up... I don't know what Star Wars ever did. They might have come up with something, but it's never really mentioned, never really... I uh, don't mind that. It just... He wants me to restart. Anyways. Um, <laughs> it's going to sit here and nag me anyways. Go away, go away. Yeah, I just did a kernel update. If you haven't figured out, I run Linux. But, uh, anyways. Where was I at? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like in uh, Star Trek, one of the things that they come up with to deal with that problem is what they call the inertial dampers, which is essentially reverse gravity. Because, uh, like, you know, like if you if you roll the ship and you suddenly do a hard, hard, you mean real hard to port, that, that ship's just maxing out. Hard to port, full you know, full sublight. Without the inertial dampers, your crew's going to go squish. <laughs> your your crew's going to literally just become this little red splotch in the on the on the uh, deck of your starship. Because the g forces that would be generated by that turn would be astronomical. Not to mention the stress on the ship. So they have, and you know, written into their stories, uh, something called inertial dampers, dampeners, which takes that inertial force created by turning and nullifies it. And the way I understand it is it nullifies it by taking gravity and reversing it. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, if it, those of you who are hardcore Star Trek fans can probably correct me on that if I'm wrong. But like I said, that's the way I understand it is it's it's basically it reverses gravity so that it you know as the inertia pushes the crew one direction, the ship's uh, gravity pushes the crew the other direction and the crew doesn't feel feels very little, if any, of the inertial effects of that turn. So, anyways, I've kind of beat on that one for about 18 minutes, almost. Uh, yeah, 18 minutes, basically, just beating on the same topic. But I did that because I wanted you guys to think on that. Because, you know, it there is uh, a requirement when it comes to stories of suspension of belief. If you get too far outside of what real science is going to say, what actual physics says should happen. Uh, I mean, there are, you, know, you can stretch it a bit. I'm not saying you can't. Let me look at Star Trek and their inertial dampers. There's ways around it. You can find things if you have to. Uh, but you want to make it such that the reader doesn't go, oh, that's impossible, and throws the book away and you know walks off and never comes back. You, know, you want it believable, but yet not, you know, so basically fantastical, but not so fantastical that it becomes unbelievable. So, anyways, uh, enough on that. Uh, point two, time travel. Uh, when I recently ran into something, and I've run into it before because I watched the movie, uh, but I'd forgotten about it. I wanted to bring this back. I don't think by the time this one gets up on YouTube, because I'm recording this, well, YouTube and Rumble, I'm recording this ahead of time, and it's I'm out by three months right now on my uh, videos. So I think this one will come up prior to my writing video on time travel. Uh, if it does, which I think it will, uh, when that time travel one comes up, this will be explained a little bit better. Uh, but the short summary is there's two basic times types of time travel. One where uh, 
parallel time exists and time travel or that'll be explained more in the time travel one but i'll do kind of the tldr on this one uh cliff notes whatever you want to call it that basically there's time travel where either you go back in time and time is parallel and you go down a different path of time which takes you down a different reality or the other type is time can't be changed what's happened and what will happen and what is happening are locked in stone so if you go back in time you don't actually change time you just become part of history basically uh, just like when you're sitting in the present you still have events in the future that you need to participate in and fulfill uh, in that same stripe if you go back in time you don't change history you just fulfill your part of history in the past so there was you know in in the case of time travel going to the past you know you're not changing time you're just fulfilling the part that you haven't fulfilled yet so uh but adventures end game uh basically there's a part in there with uh ant-man and uh dr hulk and some of the others and they're trying to talk or they're talking about well, why don't we just go back in time and kill baby thanos and all this is over and they're trying to explain uh you can't do that because if you go back in time as soon as you land uh you change history but not history for everybody you change history for yourself you go down a different timeline and things in the kind of timeline you're coming from aren't fixed you're just you just go down a different timeline where they are fixed and that's not really a solution but that's anyways i've i figure you know you guys can go back and re-listen to that scene it's it's really kind of neat and it explains that like i say one of the two theories of uh time and stuff which that that basically uh how do i say this One of the things I bring up in my, uh, which you know, this is related to time travel, but one of the things I bring up in my uh, After Offworld series, which I will be releasing eventually, um, I, I'm still waiting for some stuff on that. That's why I haven't released it yet. There's some things that need to happen before I can release that. Uh, but that's the that's kind of the it's a three book per, uh, epilogue to the Offworld Chronicles. But anyways, in there I mention about something called temporal framing which basically goes with the one theory like I was saying here where, where you don't go back in time and change it you go back in time and fulfill your part of time that is in the past just like in the present you're fulfilling your part of time in the present and eventually you'll fulfill it in the future uh, so t basically time is set it can't be changed uh, all you do is you just fill in the parts that that uh, is you know your responsibility so to speak but uh, anyways, uh, in that one, like I say, it, it basically it shows time exists as a series of frames like slides almost or uh, frames like in a movie or, or on film or something like that. And each for, you know, and you, to experience time, you pass through each one of these frames one at a time. Uh, that's explained more elsewhere. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But that, that theory about you can't change time even if you time travel... Uh, fits with the idea of temporal framing because I kind of expressed that in that book too and you see that expressed a little bit there so anyways uh, point three this video here uh, this one is a great example of tech building tech and the guy explains uh, explains it using a simple pencil and he talks about all the parts and the materials and the other things that are involved in building just a single pencil and I've mentioned this in other videos uh, at least I have it I can remember uh, if I haven't I don't know I mean I've, I've made so many videos I may have not said it but uh, oh yes I did come to think of it I did I think I said it in, in uh, Musings 9 or 10 something like that where I mentioned about Dr. Stone uh, the anime which uh, which is a great you know you may not like anime but it's a good one uh, you can either watch the the series or you can watch the or you can read the manga and it does a great job i think i mean the manga and the anime itself i don't think are are that great but i think as far as it showing what's required to build each item and each level of technology it does a great job of it because it shows you this is required to get this to get this to get this so you know and you can't it's like you can't like build a car until you actually figure out how to how to extract iron from the ground and then smelt it and then forge it and then do all these other things and then there's all these other supporting technologies that have to come in and do different things so it, it's a good good show to go through if you can get past all the corniness 
uh, it's a good one to show exactly what's needed to go from primitive technology to modern technology and all the steps that are required in between. But anyways, uh, now here, last item, number four, uh, proper use of similar words and conjunctions. I will include this image here. Uh, you know, and if you've been through English class, you know this stuff, but I, I just put this out here to remind, remind you, because there's a lot of people that use these wrong. A lot of people, especially in social networking, of course, you know, a lot of people will go, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> But yeah, like I say, though, there, you know, this is something that you always have to keep in the back of your mind. Because even I do this every so often. I I try not to. I work really hard not to. But there's times I will use the wrong word, not intentionally. Uh, like I was just now. This is the funny part too. Is sometimes it's just fat fingers. Sometimes it's typos. Sometimes it's autocorrect. Uh, I've had autocorrect bite me in the bum with these before. Uh, like recently I was editing Jenna's Journey and there was one spot in there where instead of the word TOW, T-O-W, I had it as T-W-O, so the, you know, the number two. So it's, like I say, I list this just, you know, just kind of to keep you mindful of, uh, actually needing to, uh, what am I thinking of? Actually needing to be aware of that as you're writing and it's and it's more than just you know it's more than just these words here it's just words in general because if you start using the wrong word and you consistently in your books in your stories you're going to turn off readers you're going to people are going to look at that and go no i'm not going to read it because you can't edit correctly your stuff is you know your editing's crap you need to go in here and you need to hire somebody and you might have to uh you know, like I've mentioned in other videos, I use, you know, I've switched to using uh, AI text-to-speech, and that has been a godsend for editing. Because I'll go through a book, and I think I've got it absolutely perfect, and I throw it into the AI, and the AI starts reading it back to me, and I'm just cringe. <laughs> like, oh, that sounds horrible. And then you find where you overused words, you find where you use the wrong words. Uh, like, one of them, and I'll type this out so you can, oops type this out so you guys can see this, like those two words. I have a bad habit of that, that for some reason my brain equates cloths with clothes. And I don't know why. Because I'll, I'll write a sentence and it'll be absolutely perfect and I can have the AI read it and, and it'll come back as she put her cloths on. Ah, crap, I left the E out again, you know. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's just just something to to be mindful of when you're uh, editing, and and like I say, I'm just I'm doing this not to berate you or belittle you or say you know oh you suck at this or anything. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm t I'm saying it to put that little spark in your mind to make you think about these things as you're writing because thinking about those is important. Same idea with word repetition. Uh, using certain phrases, things like that. You want that to be kind of an automatic spell check in your brain, basically. Uh, and that's, that's more or less what I'm trying to encourage. But anyways, uh, I'm done for this video. Uh, I don't have anything else that I can think of at this time. Uh, I do appreciate you guys subscribing. Uh, I'm not asking you to, but I do appreciate, the, appreciate those who have subscribed. I appreciate those of you who have shared my videos. Uh, I think it's funny. I had uh, at the time I recorded this, which is December fourteenth, that I recently posted the Gorlon encounter, which for short story Fridays, and I was like, man, if I can get as many hits on that or as views on that as I did for the Tin Cup, I'll be great. And then somebody, I don't know who you are or who, or who you know what somebody's posted that link, but my view count on that book on that short story just blew up on YouTube uh, and I really want to thank you guys for that I appreciate that I got a lot of love on that story I had one to Kirk detractor but that's fine I don't mind I mean he makes you know, he made a good point uh, he was complaining about you know the fact that oh gee that sounds so much like so many other sci-fi's out there I'm like welcome to writing <laughs> you know everybody's taking everybody else's ideas and reworking them and remaking them and you know like like I've said there's nothing new under the sun so all you do is you take something that's already out there and you make it uniquely your own as close as you can because you, you really can't come up with anything new anymore because uh, you know there's nothing new under the sun 
it's just it's just different ways of doing the same thing sometimes better sometimes worse and so on and so forth but yeah i i do thank you guys for that because that was really huge that you gave me gave me so much love on that because i've been you know i've been seeing like very low view counts and not you know nobody commenting a like you know maybe a like here or a like there and then that comes out and it just took off like lightning and i was like thank you i i just want to thank you guys i appreciate that that was that means a lot to me as a writer so anyways i will leave it at that and i will catch catch you guys in the next video